Meghan Markle, a princess in waiting like no other. Meghan is beautiful, glamorous, articulate, intelligent. Divorcee, Hollywood actress, mixed race. Has a track record of humanitarian work and campaigning and a real enthusiasm for the role. In this programme, we chart Meghan's extraordinary first 100 days as a royal fiancé. It was so sweet and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> we hear from those who have been following the bride to be's every move. The biographers. Nothing prepares you for joining the royal family. Nothing on the planet. The press. We're seeing that the Meghan effect come into force. Anything she wears is going to sell out within hours. Oh, we love you so much. <laughs> the fans. You can tell she cares about people's rights and women and all kinds of things. And the critics. Background, attitude, I worry. I think she's trouble. As we discover how Meghan is fast winning the crowd as the new People's Princess. Kensington Palace. It's been home to generations of the royal family for more than three centuries. And it was here, on November the 27th, 2017, that Meghan Markle made her first appearance as Prince Harry's fiancé. Harry, when did you know she was the one? Um, <laughs> the very first time you met. Prince Harry had proposed to Meghan at his two-bedroom cottage inside the Kensington estate earlier that month. But now they were making the news public, and Meghan was making an immediate impression. What struck me most on the engagement day was how calm, considered, sophisticated Meghan was. I'm so happy. <laughs> Please welcome the lovely Meghan Markle, everybody. Meghan wasn't your typical royal bride to be. She was American. I'm a California girl, born and raised. A divorcee, and from a mixed race background. She was also a seasoned Hollywood actress who, unlike her young and inexperienced predecessors, knew exactly how to hold herself in front of the cameras. So, Meg, okay. You guys, thank you so much. I was reminded of the days when Prince Charles and Princess Diana came out on their engagement day and how awkward and uh, inarticulate it all was. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> It didn't have the right feel to it. And even when Catherine and William became engaged, Catherine seemed very, very nervous. No, it, it's very important to me, and, uh, you know, I, I hope we'll, you know, be able to have a happy... She was the one who seemed the least nervous of the lot. The engagement announcement attracted media from all over the world. The photographers were desperate for the definitive front-page shot of their genuine American princess. And it came right at the end. The real picture is the one where they think they're out of view and they put their arms round each other's waist. Very unroyal and very lovely. At 36, Meghan was three years older than Harry. Like Harry's parents, her father Tom and mother Dory had split before she reached her teens. After developing her acting ambitions at high school, she went on to obtain a university degree. By the time she met Harry, 13 years later, she was a small screen star, thanks to her role in the American TV drama series, Suits. The one thing that fascinates me about this is the fact that she is a product of Hollywood, product of television, product of entertainment. And therefore, there's a sort of ease in communication and there is an inbuilt knowledge of what the media are trying to get at. It was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind date. Blind date and for sure. Meghan's like... ease was there for all to see in the interview that followed the engagement announcement. You know, even then, I, you know, because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so while I now understand very clearly there's a, a global interest there, I didn't know much about him. And so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? She's different because she represents the global world we're in, the fascination we have in America, the fascination we have in celebrity, diversity, and she's a very strong woman. The headlines from Meghan's debut in the royal media glare were overwhelmingly positive. But this was still day one. And from some, there were words of caution. The head over heels in love, uh, and she's obviously been accepted very willingly uh, by the rest of the family. 
So in a way, it's it's a bit of a, a, a negative thing to say, but I, I do have just a few warning bells ringing. She's coming over to the UK. She's going to have to live a very different sort of life because it's the British life anyway, not the American life. But much more than that, she's going to have to live the royal life, which is restricting. I mean, there isn't any doubt about it. It is restricting. Nothing prepares you for joining the royal family. Nothing on the planet. You can be the most famous actress in Hollywood, but the kind of scrutiny that she's under, the kind of learning curve that she's going through now is formidable. I'm not convinced that Meghan understands entirely what she is taking on and whether she will like it when she... December the 1st. Meghan Markle, a princess in waiting like no other. Meghan is beautiful, glamorous, articulate, intelligent. Divorcee, Hollywood actress, mixed race. Has a track record of humanitarian work and campaigning and a real enthusiasm for the role. In this program, we chart Meghan's extraordinary first 100 days as a royal fiancé. It was so sweet and natural and very romantic. He got on with me. <laughs> We hear from those who have been following the bride to bees every move. The biographers. Nothing prepares you for joining the royal family. Nothing on the planet. The press. We're seeing that the Meghan effect come into force. Anything she wears is going to sell out within hours. Oh, we love you so much. <laughs> the fans. You to tell she cares about people's rights and women and all kinds of things. And the critics. Background, attitude, I worry. I think she's trouble. As we discover how Meghan is fast winning the crowd, as the new People's Princess. Kensington Palace. It's been home to generations of the royal family for more than three centuries. And it was here, on November the 27th, 2017, that Meghan Markle made her first appearance as Prince Harry's fiancé. Harry, when did you know she was the one? Um, <laughs> the very first time we met. Prince Harry had proposed to Meghan at his two-bedroom cottage inside the Kensington estate earlier that month. But now they were making the news public, and Meghan was making an immediate impression. What struck me most on the engagement day was how calm, considered, sophisticated Meghan was. I'm so happy. <laughs> Please welcome the lovely Meghan Markle, everyone. Meghan wasn't your typical royal bride to be. She was American. I'm a California girl, born and raised. A divorcee, and from a mixed race background. She was also a seasoned Hollywood actress, who, unlike her young and inexperienced predecessors, knew exactly how to hold herself in front of the cameras. So, Meg, okay. You guys, thank you so much. I was reminded of the days when Prince Charles and Princess Diana came out on their engagement day and how awkward and uh, inarticulate it all was. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> it didn't have the right feel to it. And even when Catherine and William became engaged, Catherine seemed very, very nervous. No, it, it's very important to me and, uh, you know, I, I hope we'll you know, be able to have a happy... She was the one who seemed the least nervous of the lot. The engagement announced attracted media from all over the world. The photographers were desperate for the definitive front page shot of their genuine American princess. And it came right at the end. The real picture is the one where they think they're out of view and they put their arms round each other's waist. Very unroyal and very lovely. At 36, Meghan was three years older than Harry. Like Harry's parents, her father Tom and mother Dory had split before she reached her teens. After developing her acting ambitions at high school, she went on to obtain a university degree. By the time she met Harry, 13 years later, she was a small screen star, thanks to her role in the American TV drama series, Suits. The one thing that fascinates me about this is the fact that she is a product of Hollywood, product of television, product of entertainment, and therefore, there's a sort of ease in communication. 
and there is an inbuilt knowledge of what the media are trying to get at. It was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind date. Sure. Megan's like, ease was there for all to see in the interview that followed the engagement announcement. You know, and even then, I, you know, because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so while I now understand very clearly there's a, a global interest there, I didn't know much about him. And so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? She's different because she represents the global world we're in, the fascination we have in America, the fascination we have in celebrity, diversity, and she's a very strong woman. The headlines from Meghan's debut in the royal media glare were overwhelmingly positive. But this was still day one. And from some, there were words of caution. The head over heels in love, uh, and she's obviously been accepted very willingly uh, by the rest of the family. So in a way, it's it's a bit of a, a, a negative thing to say, but I, I do have just a few warning bells ringing. She's coming over to the UK. She's going to have to live a very different sort of life because it's the British life anyway, not the American life. But much more than that, she's going to have to live the royal life, which is restricting. I mean, there isn't any doubt about it. It is restricting. Nothing prepares you for joining the royal family. Nothing planet. You can be the most famous actress in Hollywood, but the kind of scrutiny that she's under, the kind of learning curve that she's going through now, is formidable. I'm not convinced that Meghan understands entirely what she is taking on, and whether she will like it when she... December the 1st, and after basking in the headlines of their announcement earlier in the week, it was time for Meghan to fulfil her first official royal engagement. She would have been told, it's like walking the red carpet, except for the fact that there's no red carpet, it's cold and it usually rains, and the conversation is about the weather. It was clear from day one, that first walkabout in Nottingham, that she was like a duck to water. She is absolutely natural at this, very engaging, very warm, lots of eye contact talking to people, getting to know them. It's quite cute, actually. A lot of the time you'll hear her say, hello, I'm Megan. Well, I think most people there know who she is, but she's just, you know, introducing herself uh, just as normally as she can. Harry chose Nottingham for their first engagement. It's home to Full Effect, a youth project he has supported for the last four years. That same day, the couple visited a World AIDS Day fair. It was a cause Harry's mother had famously championed 30 years earlier, when the disease was still a firm taboo. You could see the pride in Prince Harry. I mean, it was a joy to watch. Of course, Diana would be in their minds because, do you remember, she was the first person publicly, a royal person, to touch somebody with AIDS. Diana was amazing that she sat with men who had HIV, she held their hand, she talked to them, she had friends who died of AIDS, and... She did more than anybody at the very beginning to say, this is a terrible illness, we should not turn away from it, we should support people with it. Meghan was proving popular in her debut engagements, but the road ahead wouldn't be so smooth. Coming up, controversy in the Big Brother house as one celebrity guest takes aim. I, I worry. She's older than him. I add it all up and I'm uneasy. All I said was I thought because of her background that she could, not would, but that she could, uh, be trouble. And how the Fab Four are born. The photographers at the other end. <laughs> with a photo snapped on a phone. I took one photo and it was, yeah, the right one. <laughs> 14 days after announcing their engagement, Meghan paid a visit to Windsor Castle, home to St. George's Chapel, where it was announced she and Harry would be married. St. George's has housed a number of smaller royal weddings. Back in 1999, Harry's uncle, Prince Edward, married Sophie Rees Jones here. Although Harry and Meghan had chosen a wedding session steeped in tradition, they had different ideas when it came to naming the date. 2018. Recent royal weddings had all been held on weekdays, but not this one. I think that they thought, we want people to enjoy this, so why not do it on a Saturday? And if you think about most weddings that you and I go to, 
They're at the weekend, so why wouldn't you follow suit? But there was one reason to avoid that Saturday. It had already been announced as the date of the FA Cup final. As president of the Football Association, Harry's brother, Prince William, was expected to take his usual place in the Royal Box at Wembley. And millions more were looking forward to watching the game on TV. I think my wife would probably want to see the, um, the Royal Wedding. So what I'd probably do, I'd probably leave her on her own, maybe with some of her friends. I'll go somewhere else where like-minded people want to watch the FA Cup final. I would so prefer to watch a royal wedding, not interested in football. Harry and Meghan solved the problem for TV viewers. They announced that their ceremony would begin at noon, several hours earlier than kickoff time. But William decided to avoid the fixture clash altogether, scrapping his Wembley appointment to concentrate fully on the wedding. December the 13th. With Christmas less than a fortnight away, Harry and Meghan were preparing to spend their first one together. In 2016, Meghan had spent it with her family in Los Angeles. But this time, she had received an invitation to join Harry and the royal family at their Christmas residence in Norfolk. It was a tremendous break with convention that the Queen invited Meghan, who was, after all, just a fiancé, to Sandringham because normally it's just the wives and the husbands of members of the royal family who are allowed there. The fact that the Queen obviously was so happy to welcome her there uh, says a lot about uh, the way she's been received into the family. It does show that the Queen is walking in step with the change of the guard at Buckingham Palace. Like her father before her, the Queen has been celebrating Christmas on the 20,000 acre estate since childhood. In that time, certain customs had developed, and new family members were expected to share them. Well, Meghan would have had to get her head around quite a few uh, royal family traditions. They open their presents on Christmas Eve. The presents that they exchange aren't what you'd really expect for members of the royal family. They tend to share really jokey presents with one another. In America, you know, things will come beautifully wrapped and be quite extravagant. And this is the other end of the sphere. You're admired if you find given you an unusual spoon to stir cakes in or an unusual thing to keep your corgis in. Surroundings, Meghan took part in the most public of all royal festive traditions, the post-service walkabout at St Mary Magdalene Church. Well, the Sandringham Church photo is the timeline through history. You have a snapshot every year of those people closest to the throne. Now, often, looking at a picture of a child who was barely able to walk perhaps a year ago and suddenly they come out of the church. That image will change. In a few years' time, you'll have those couples and their children will be going to church. In a few more years' time, and you may not have the older generation. This year, of course, was Meghan's year. The presence of the royal fiancé meant the public turnout was even bigger than usual. Everybody had lined up, so there's barriers there. And we saw a space, a tiny space, so it was absolutely packed, tiny space, and we ran. Along with the public, the world's media were also out in force. The prize was a photo of Harry and Meghan alongside the other young royal couple, William and Kate. Unfortunately for all the photographers on the ground, they just didn't seemed to get a clear shot and in the end it came down to a member of the public, a lady called Karen Anvil, who brilliantly captured all four of them looking in the right direction. It was like everything was set up for it to happen. We were waiting for, I'd say, half an hour and then it was totally insane. It was like a Mexican wave of cheers, so you knew they were coming. The photographers at the other end... and they just happened to look over. And I took one photo, that's the thing. I took one photo and it was, yeah, the right one. When we saw that shot, it was an absolute no-brainer that it was gonna be our cover shot because it was the only one that had captured that moment, the four of them together. And, you know, it symbolized quite a lot.
in terms of the royal family and where they're going in future. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were delighted to use it on the cover. Many other magazines and newspapers were too, which all added up to an unexpected Christmas present for the amateur snapper. I didn't post the image on social media to make money. I was proud of it and I wanted to share it and it wasn't a money making. But yes, it's changed my life for I can't even begin to tell you how much. I've had my bathroom tiled, I'm having my kitchen tiled, I'm going to get new carpets, I'm going to get my garden done. Boxing Day, traditional date of the royal shoot. It was first established by King Edward VII and has remained a firm family fixture for well over a century. Harry had taken part since he was a teenager. But not this time. The story is that Harry didn't go on the grass shoot, which is the big event of Boxing Day. And Meghan apparently doesn't like shooting. Whether she persuaded him, could that be a bit of journalistic extravaganza? In fact, instead of attending the event in Norfolk, Harry was making his way to London to prepare for a long-standing appointment the next day with the BBC. Time is seven minutes past six. Today's programme is guest edited by Prince Harry, and he is here. And Morning. Very good to see you. you have As part of his guest editorship of Radio 4's Today, Today programme, Harry nice chose the topics, as well as the interviewees, including former US President Barack Obama. OK. But I need the British accent. But if you start, if you start using long pauses between um, the answers, you're probably going to get right. the, 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 the face. Are you... <laughs> Let me see the face. Oh, OK. <laughs> for many, many years, and obviously I can't get involved in politics. Harry sat in the editor's chair for the three-hour programme on the morning of the 27th. But whether or not he timed his assignment to avoid upsetting his animal-loving fiancée remains a mystery. It's clearly obvious the points that I'm trying... Royals may change, royal behaviour may change, all sorts of things. Or maybe she'll forever say, you can go on those things, I don't want to shoot animals. <laughs> then, at the end of the programme, one of the hosts snuck in a personal question. It yes. was your future wife's first Christmas with the in-laws. Mm -hmm. How was it? Uh, she, she really enjoyed it. The family um, loved having her there. And, it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the family I suppose she's never had. But Harry's comments did not go down well with one member of Meghan's family. Meghan's half-sister, Samantha, was very cross with what Harry said on the Today programme about the family not being close or a normal family. Samantha tweeted that that was really not the case. And she defended their family as, as a normal family, a close family, a loving family, and didn't understand what Harry was talking about. But the press wouldn't let it drop. And as they dug deeper, a picture of a split family emerged. Meghan was about two when her parents split up, and they didn't divorce till she was seven. But that's very young, really, for a child to have their parents in different places. Her dad worked as a lighting director. He was a real workaholic. So I'd say Meghan had quite a disrupted upbringing. She was shuttling back and forth between two parents, which is never easy for a, for a small child. Meghan grew up with two significantly older half-siblings from her father's previous relationship. Half-sister Samantha was 15 years her senior. I think we get a picture of Meghan as a small child, very much in an adult world, maybe seeing things that most little girls wouldn't have been aware of, whether that was being on sets with her father or her teenage brother and his friends smoking dope around her when she was a small child. It's not a classic suburban childhood. Whatever the truth of Meghan's family background, the promise of more details came when Sister Samantha threatened to publish a tell-all book called Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. I think the very fact that Samantha wanted to do a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister implies that maybe she was not over-fond of her younger half-sister and maybe is a little conflicted about Meghan's success. Samantha also criticised Meghan's charity work. If you are interested in helping those less fortunate than yourself, it really should begin at home. Tales about Meghan's ex-husband, Trevor Engelson, also hit the press. They had married after being together for seven years. But when Meghan moved to Toronto to film Suits, their relationship suffered, and in 2013, they divorced. Trevor's friends said it was a bolt from the blue to him when Meghan ended the marriage. And she ended the marriage in such an abrupt way that she actually ended up sending the engagement ring back by registered post. He's said by friends to be extremely angry still.
Five weeks after their first walkabout, Harry and Meghan were back on the road. Their destination, one of the most ethnically diverse communities in the UK. Brixton, for me, was a game changer. A lot had been written about Meghan having a black mother and a white father. But that suddenly made you realise there were millions of people who loved the royals but would never have stood out in the cold to wait for one and they'll wait for Meghan. For those young people, the idea of a royal coming and visit them must have seemed really far-fetched and suddenly you've got the hottest royal, you know, the hottest royal couple at, at, at the time. <laughs> I think that matters. I think that has an impact. People will have thought, wow, she actually came and spoke to us and she seems quite nice. As part of their visit to South London, Harry and Meghan called in on local radio station Represent. They actually shook my hand. I didn't expect that. I thought, you know, it would just be a distance. Um, they were pretty cool. Believe it or not, Everyone is listening, and I'm in the same room as the royal couple right now. They both put on headphones and listened in through the cans. And so good to meet you. It meant a lot for the royal couples to come to Brixton. People are thinking, wow, they've seen value in our area and all the people of Brixton. This is going to have an impact on race relations in Britain. It has to. It's a mixed race person enter into a white family, so you find that it might have a bit of controversy, but you see, it is what it is. It's love and it has no boundary, you know? It was a real nice, good, feel good factor. They should come more often. They really should. The Brixton visit went down well with most, but not everyone championed Meghan. That same day, former Conservative government minister Anne Widdecombe, a die-hard fan of the royal family, voiced her doubts about Meghan's suitability as a future member. Not in private, but in the most public setting possible, the celebrity Big Brother house. I think she's probably... Uh, how long do you think she's going to be? Five Why years, ten trouble? years, twenty years? Why do you think she's trouble, Anne? Background, um... Attitude, I... I, I worry. She's older than him. She's been married before. Yes. I add it all up and I'm uneasy. But there we go. Quite frankly, I was shocked when Anne Widdicombe said that what she said. I mean, I've always thought that she was a sensible woman. She seems to be jumping to conclusions without looking at any evidence. I'm sure that she doesn't have much time for Meghan Markle. The ex-minister's comments provoked an immediate and fierce debate on social media. When I was on Big Brother, I was called every ick and every ist going. I was homophobic, xenophobic, uh, racist, sexist, misogynist. Nothing I said could have been remotely construed as racist by any sensible observer. I mean, all I said was I thought that because of her background and I was thinking of freewheeling Hollywood background, you know, former marriage all the rest of it, uh, that because of her background, I thought that she could, not would, but that she could uh, be trouble. She had, I think, the older generation's view of this is an outsider, a foreigner, coming into a very British organisation, almost, you could say. How is that going to work? The thing that all of us have to do is adapt. We're in the here and now. Embrace. Coming up, the politics of the guest list causes a potential row as she and Harry draw up the invites. Have you got an invite to the Royal Wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. Would you like to go? I want them to be happy. January the 13th. Ever since Meghan's romance with Prince Harry was made public, she'd been a target for anonymous trolls on social media. Now, six weeks after her engagement announcement, more derogatory comments about her race were uncovered, this time in a series of texts. They came from Joe Marnie, girlfriend of then UK Independence Party leader Henry Bolton. There was a time when people just muttered in corners of pubs. Now, at the press of a button, you know, you can disseminate your views to half the world. I'd like to think that, that comments like, like Joe Marnie's are super rare. I'm kind of more concerned with how the general public treats her, and they seem to be at the very least, 
accepting of her, uh, if not embracing of her. Six weeks after Marnie's comments, Henry Bolton was ousted as leader of UKIP. The world is becoming more right-wing, more intolerant. Uh, so uh, people of mixed race, African-American descent, um, Muslims and others who do not fit the mould of the majority have to be careful. And certainly Meghan is going to find racism uh, wherever she goes. When it comes to weddings, drawing up the guest list is a minefield for any couple. Since the announcement, Meghan had to cope with constant speculation over which members of her family would be invited. Relationships with her half-brother and half-sister were reportedly strained, but she gave no clue as to whether they'd be attending. There were also doubts about whether Meghan's father, Tom Senior, would make it to the wedding. There has been some speculation that Tom Markle might not be well enough to be there for Meghan's big day and to walk her down the aisle. He's said to be a bit of a recluse, he's not in very good health. And he was said to be very nervous uh, about coming and playing such a public role. Definitely coming over to give her away for the wedding, but that, that's all been a, a matter of some conjecture about whether he'd even make it. But on the 28th of January, one other guest list mystery was solved. Have you got an invite to the royal wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. Would you like to go? I want them to be happy. I really want them to be happy. They look like a lovely couple. Meghan Markle did say you were a divisive misogynist. Well, I still hope they're happy. It was the source of quite a lot of amusement for comedians in the US who like to take every opportunity they can to poke fun at him. So Donald Trump is mad because Prince Harry didn't invite him to the, to the wedding, to the royal wedding over there in England. Now, I don't even know why. I don't know why you mad. You shouldn't even be surprised, uh, Donald. Don't nobody like you. The apparent decision to snub the US president may have been a source of jokes for comedians, but according to some sections of the media, it was also a potential invited Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, a friend to them both. But as Harry and Meghan's wedding is a non-state event, that means he and Meghan don't have to follow the same diplomatic rules as William Kate did back in 2011. This is not a state occasion, this wedding. He can invite his friends and Meghan's friends. He doesn't have to invite Trump. It's as simple as that. The 12th of February, after a series of very public walkabouts, news came of a much more private meeting. Meghan paid at least two unpublicized visits to a mosque near Grenfell Tower, the scene of a devastating fire in June 2017. I live not very far away from Grenfell. Um, I was absolutely mortified, shocked, and really distressed by what was un unfolding, and I wanted to get involved. Magella Green is an active supporter of the Grenfell families, many of whom worship at the mosque. Since the fire, in which 71 people were confirmed to have died, they've become used to high-profile visits. But Meghan's took place away from the cameras. She's actually building trust with people in the community rather than just doing the media showbiz, look at me, doing fabulous things. I think she's actually got, uh, got it right. Meghan's visit had echoes of the charity work undertaken by an earlier princess. It reminded me very much of Diana and the fact that she went, made secret visits to the homeless at the South Bank, to hospitals to see people on their final journey. Just like Diana did things in private, so too Meghan. And I think me that was a striking revelation because it shows you that she's not in it for herself she's in it for others during their series of post-engagement walkabouts harry and meghan took care to include all four countries in the uk attracting different crowds in each on february the 13th it was scotland's turn in edinburgh they visited a city center cafe that employs rough sleepers in an attempt to put them back on their feet Alice Thompson founded the cafe in 2012. Remarkably, she had been inspired by Meghan herself. It is said that girls with dreams become women with vision. I had actually seen Meghan Markle give a speech at the UN Women Conference in 2015. For me, as a young woman in business, I, I was really, really inspired by that. It really gave me a good 
bit a boost of confidence um, to go out there and know that I could do it. I was just so moved by it, so I felt like it was only appropriate to tell her that it had really inspired me to continue the work I was doing. Really emotional, and she explained to me that she had been so nervous to give that speech, and uh, and she seemed really touched and delighted that it had affected somebody positively. Just sort of went to shake her hand to say goodbye, and she sort of nudged it out of the way and just embraced me with a with a cuddle. <laughs> The embrace provided the press with the perfect photo opportunity and the royal protection officers with a headache. Meghan is definitely more huggy than the uh, royal norm. The royals have all been briefed by their security detail. Don't get into selfies, don't have people holding their arms around you because, OK, 99% of people mean well, but there are some people out there who don't mean well. And once they've got their arm around you, you're in a vulnerable position. That's why the security guys don't like too many selfies too many hugs. As Meghan toured the cities and towns of the UK, it wasn't just her personality that was proving popular. The clothes she wore were also making headlines. The £2,000 Burberry tartan coat she wore in Edinburgh sold out within hours. And her handbag by small Scottish company Strathbury put this local business on the global map. In the same way that we saw the Kate effect after the Duchess of Cambridge got married and started being copied by women all over the world, we're seeing that the Megan effect come into, into force, and it is quite a force. Anything she wears is going to sell out within hours. Megan is following in the footsteps of other stylish royal women, most notably Harry's mother, Diana, who was regarded as one of the biggest style icons of the late 20th century. But it hadn't always been so. When she married into the royal family, Diana was an unassuming 20-year-old, known by the press as Shy Di. <laughs> Meghan, on the other hand, joins the royals with well-established fashion credentials. Meghan was already very um, fashionable and well-known for her fashion. She had a, her own clothing line back in Canada while she was filming suits. I think designers are going to be falling over themselves to dress her. She's really setting trends for all kinds of things. I imagine there's a whole generation of young women out there wearing mismatching earrings and you know, lots of delicate jewellery on their fingers because it's what Meghan does. Từng đến tôi nhớ về, cuộc đời yêu trên bốn bề sóng lo. Phụ nữ tôi về thuở xa xưa, bay cao cùng cánh diều, đu chơi mây đã bạc. Một nhịp ngày thơ vui đùa ngày tháng. Để lòng tôi hân hoan cùng trời mây. Ngày xưa đâu yêu còn đâu? Royal weddings are huge global TV events. Harry and Meghan's is expected to attract an audience of around two billion. The same number who tuned in as Prince William married Kate Middleton six years ago. This time, the eyes of the world will be on Windsor, where both the ceremony and procession will be held. But on February the 14th, the leader of the local council was forced to U-turn a controversial proposal to remove rough sleepers from the streets for the royal wedding. The suggestion had gone down badly with the locals. They're sort of treated like rubbish if you're saying that they need to be removed for the royal wedding. I don't agree with that. The people of Windsor, they don't believe that people should have to sleep in a doorway or beg for money. They think they should be given whatever help and support they need. As outrage grew, a petition was raised opposing the council's plans. For this councillor in Windsor to say that the streets of Windsor should be cleared of the homeless, he couldn't have, he couldn't have picked a worse target to attack or, or a family, the royal family, to annoy. You've got Prince William, the president, chairman of Centrepoint for homeless young people. So the royal family, if they know anything, they know that they support any measures to help the homeless and it ain't just clearing them off the street. The public pressure succeeded and the idea of removing the homeless from the eyes of the world was shelved. February the 22nd. A suspicious package containing a white powder and a racist note was sent in the post. It arrived at the royal household 
Megan's name on it. The good news is the security operation worked, the package never got to Megan, it was intercepted, and the powder that was in there wasn't anthrax, it was a uh, harmless substance. But clearly the message was nasty, was racist, and that is being uh, investigated. Uh, Meghan Markle is, is marrying into the world's number one family, um, and that comes with a tremendous threat because of what um, the British royal family actually stand for across the globe. Following the incident, security around Meghan was reportedly stepped up. Five weeks later, it was announced that Windsor will be subject to unprecedented safety measures on the day of the wedding, with anyone wishing to enter the town centre passing through airport-style security scanners. I think Meghan will, will obviously be aware that she's now a target. So she knows now that she's moved from being a mid-level TV personality to being a major target, and I'm afraid she's going to have to live with that, as the rest of the royal family do. For years before she got her big TV break, she'd been a struggling actress in Hollywood. And from the announcement of her engagement to Harry, newspapers had been poring over her early life for any hint of scandal. On February the 24th, the latest unwelcome headlines, linking her with anonymous social media posts written several years earlier. The diary has no name on it, and in it there's a phrase about magic boobs. This has been powerful upon by certain newspapers as a story about Meghan. For Meghan supporters, the coverage was an intrusion into her life before her engagement. For royal watchers, the coverage was a reminder of the press intrusion experienced by Princess Diana a quarter of a century earlier, and a warning to Meghan of what might lie ahead. I think Diana was hounded by the press, but she also used the press, um, and, and sometimes effectively. Uh, but if you use the press and media extensively, you've got to understand they won't go away when it's convenient. Meghan's going to have to suffer quite a lot of over-interest, probably, from here to the wedding and probably for a year or two after that. If she continues to use the press and media, that's fine, because then, you know, she's um, uh, publicising her causes, so that's fine, I don't have a problem with that. But if she does continue to use them, then she's got to accept right from the start that when things go wrong, they're still going to be there in great numbers. Coming up, the new Fab Four take to the stage for the first time. I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. And will Meghan decide to be baptised before the big day? February the 28th, Meghan takes the stage at the Royal Foundation, an umbrella group of charities supported by Harry, William and Kate. Here, Meghan, already known for her support of women's rights, addressed the issue of equality. People say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. And I think there is no better time than to really continue to shine a light on women feeling empowered and people really helping to support them. For some critics, it was a step too far for a soon-to-be royal. She verged on the political uh, when she was talking about women's empowerment, and it was all a bit Me Too-ish. The royals don't do that. And indeed, the day that the royals start engaging in political causes is the day you get a lot of controversy. There is a very good reason why the royals stay off politics, and it's to avoid precisely that. They don't vote. They're... The royal family talking about those campaigns. The Kensington Palace that it would have been impossible for Meghan to talk about issues surrounding female empowerment without talking about those campaigns. It's interesting that Meghan speaking up in favour of Me Too and Time's Up is already being examined as if it may somehow breach impartiality rules, as if saying not treating women badly is somehow a political thing to say is ludicrous. But it is obviously a new way for the royal family to be speaking that overtly and that strongly, and it's fantastic. It was very special. It was beautiful, um, sincere, and uh, very moving. It was a great privilege. March the 6th, exactly 100 days after her engagement was announced, Meghan was baptized by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Before marrying into the royal family, she chose to join the Church of England, of which the Queen is Supreme Governor. It was reported that the Archbishop had guided Meghan through the preparations for the baptism. 
he would have had some meetings, a few meetings with Megan in a very relaxed sort of way, more of a conversation rather than uh, you know, the Archbishop telling, you know, Megan, you know, what the Christian faith is all about. The private baptism took place in the chapel of St. James's Palace. It would have been a very intimate occasion, just a few family and friends present. Although she had attended a Catholic school in LA, Megan had a Protestant background. Her father was a member of the Episcopal Church of the United States. It would not have been an enormous step, you know, to get baptized, but it was a big step in a way. But I think out of deference to the Queen and to her very strong faith, it sort of tidied things up and it all goes well for the future because she will have to attend many, you know, services in Church of England cathedrals. In her first 100 days, Meghan has proved popular with many, but she's also sparking debate and in some quarters, controversy. It has been suggested she will modernize the monarchy, which has been received with both delight and concern. But what of the future? Meghan is so different and so interesting and so modern. It is going to turbocharge his work and his purpose. I would really hope that she carries on being outspoken. I, I hope that the royal machine doesn't try too hard to manage her message. This does feel like a really transformative moment for a modern monarchy in modern Britain. They're not going to be the same again. The fact that she's unusual for the royal family, I think the fact that she comes from a different country, a different background, it's just a plus. Within a hundred days, the impact... The perfect modern princess.
the head over heels in love. Uh, and she's obviously been accepted very willingly uh, by the rest of the family. So in a way, it's it's a bit of a, a, a negative thing to say. But I, I do have just a few warning bells ringing. She's coming over to the UK. She's going to have to live a very different sort of life because it's the British life anyway, not the American life. But much more than that, she's going to have to live the royal life, which is restricting. I mean, there isn't any doubt about it. It is restricting. Nothing prepares you for joining the royal family. Nothing on the planet. You can be the most famous actress in Hollywood, but the kind of scrutiny that she's under, the kind of learning curve that she's going through now is formidable. I'm not convinced that Meghan understands entirely what she is taking on and whether she will like it when she... December the 1st. 